Welcome to another episode of Eric's Perspective. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Lauren Cross, uh, the Gail Oxford Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, and I should point out that we're actually at the Huntington. And can you tell us the room that we're in now? What's, what is this room called? We are in the Scott, um, Scott Galleries of American Arts ah. um, in the exhibition called G's Ben Shared Legacy. Excellent. So we're going to talk about it a little bit. But before we get to that, I thought we would just start off by asking about you personally. So uh, where were you born and where were you raised? I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. So I'm a Texas girl. <laughs> Um, and just really a couple months ago started, um, started here at the Huntington. Excellent. And so uh, where did you uh, go to school? When I say school, I mean college. So I started out um, at the University of Texas at Arlington, which is um, in between Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh-huh. Um, and I was studying photography, media, and um Photography and media arts was what I was studying there. Okay. Um, and then I decided to do a study abroad in London, England for a semester um, at Richmond, the American International University in oh. London, England. Ah. Um, and I really kind of fell in love with London um, as a city. Um, and so I transferred. <laughs> oh, really? So I left um, the University of Texas at Arlington and transferred there to London and that so that's where I got my bachelor's degree in art design and media and then um, graduated came home um, and then met my uh, well I had already met my husband but we um, made it official <laughs> by, so that, to speak. by that you mean you actually got married <laughs> yes and okay. he was going to school at the New, New England Conservatory of Music in Boston at the time um, so I moved Boston, obviously, uh-huh. and went to Leslie University. It used to be called the Art Institute of Boston at Leslie University in Cambridge. Uh-huh. And so I got my MFA there. And what was your MFA? What were you specializing in? Uh, so um, it was a studio art program based in visual arts. So very interdisciplinary. Um, you know, I have an interdisciplinary st- studio art background working across photography and different media and inst- in installation. So um, so that program was perfect for me. Excellent, excellent. So just going back for a minute to uh, London, what was it about London that you liked so much? How, how, how were you attracted to them? Yeah, I think, you know, it was really, you know, the happy medium of being in a foreign country yeah. um, where I sp- spoke English, obviously. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, when I was in art school, um, one of my um, art history professors asked us the question of, like, you know, we would study, we would talk about certain works of art, and then she would say, how many of you have seen this work in person? And then most of the students would raise their hand, or they would say, oh, I've been to London, I've been to Paris. And so I was usually the only one in the class that didn't have their hand raised. And so I was like, hey, wait a minute, maybe I should be going to Europe and (laughs) seeing um, these works in in person. So that was part of the reason why I wanted to study abroad. Uh Um, But I really kind of fell in love with the the gallery culture there. There's so many galleries in the the university that I went to. They really prided themselves in taking us out into the galleries when we were learning about art. So Uh we didn't, it wasn't so much like, sure, we had lectures, but we spent a lot of time in the museums, in the galleries, looking at the work in person. And so I think just that way of learning, I just was like, okay, how could I go back? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so that was part of the, the draw. Oh, uh, okay. And that's such a, I think, a great way of learning, actually. You just actually do, if you can, get in front of the pieces and, and see them and experience them for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you trace your interest in art in general? Uh, did it start when you were a child? And how did that, how did that spark get lit? That's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, when I was little, like my mom would always say, like, that I was very creative. I used to spend a lot of hours on the kitchen table, like, painting with watercolors. And, you know, my mom really encouraged, you know, giving me space and time to create or, you know, write 
I was like really big into writing poetry and things like that. So I think I just had a lot of space and time when I was growing up to be creative. Yes. Um, and then um, I started winning awards for things um, growing up um, in elementary, like different things that I would create. My teacher would send it off to like district you know, competition, and I would maybe get second prize. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was an encouraging was, thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it was very encouraging. Um, and then I kind of like, you know, when you're growing up, people aren't like, ooh, sh- you should grow up and be an artist or be right. involved in art. Right. It wasn't really something that I thought was a career trajectory. Um, so I, I really went like, you know, a very traditional route initially. I thought I would be a nurse. Um, cause my aunt was a nurse and I always thought that that was, I always thought she was really cool and I love that she knew how to take care, take care of people. Um, and, and so ultimately when I went to college, that's kind of when I realized that you could actually study art, you could major in art. I had friends that majored in music. And so that kind of sparked in me that like, oh, like you can actually, you, if you're creative, you can actually study art. Um, And so that kind of like opened up a whole new world for me. Um, And so I kind of, I did a little bit of a tester. I took a photography class. I had always loved photography. Um, And so I kind of told myself, if I I do really well in this photography class, I'm going to (laughs) switch and do do art. And, And I did. And so the rest is history. That's fantastic. So the thing to keep in mind is you're you're a curator and so forth, but you're also an artist as well. Even now, do you still uh, create? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, I think it's it's a big part of my curatorial practices is the knowledge of making, the knowledge of materials, you know, and how different artists make things. That helps me to interpret what I'm curating, and I often, you know, am have that appreciation of the artists themselves, you know, and and caring for them as people. So that's a big part of my curatorial practice. I'm sure that makes the artist feel good. You can, uh, you're an artist yourself, so you can, you understand what the things they go through. Yes, yes. In terms of the creative process, in terms of the risk that artists take and and putting stuff down on paper or on, uh, in a musical composition or whatever it is. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways that's how I got into curating is being an artist myself and recognizing that there were so few few ways in which artists could really get certain types of opportunities. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I became really passionate about, okay, how can I create opportunities for other artists that I felt deserved the platform? Um, and so I just started curating, yeah. you know, um, and my first curatorial um, exhibition was actually a quilt ex- exhibition. So that's how I started. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Um, um, and that was inspired by, in graduate school, I was learn- I was in an African-American art history course. Okay. Um, and so I was doing a lot of research on African-American women artists. And, and so in a lot of my books, you know, when you can start to look at African-American women artists, like those earlier works, were often quilters. Uh Um, And I come from a family of quilters. (laughs) Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So so then it was kind of like, oh, my God. Like, so not only was I creative, I came from a family of creative people. So would that be your your mother? My mother. Well, my mother wasn't a quilter, but she is definitely a creative person. She probably would never say that, but she's (laughs) very creative. Um, and my grandmother was very creative. She helped her her mother quilt. Um, I mean, she was like master chef, master baker in her own right. Oh, wow. um, but my great grandmother was the one who actually quilted, and oh, so wow. that kind of sparked my interest in the decorative arts um, because um, as I was learning about African American art history and understanding that. Um, many of those women, you know, um, from the enslaved to Reconstruction era to civil rights, and you know, Harlem Renaissance, that they were involved in quilting. Um, and my great grandmother was one of those in her community. Um, and so it was it just kind of awakened a whole interest for me. Sure. Um, and I have a very uh, my family is very family history driven. 
So for me to like find out things about my ancestors is like very significant. Yeah. Um, and so when I was in art school, I'm like basically learning that my grandmother, uh, that my great grandmother was an artist as I'm in graduate school and wondering why I was being like, I, I felt like I was like being really inspired by fabric and not really knowing why. Like, why am I interested in fabric? I'm a photographer. Like, <laughs> photographers, you know, print on paper. Yes, yes. Um, and so learning that she was a quilter, like really just like, it, it kind of felt like, oh, like this is why I'm really interested in fabric. Like she was a quilter and, you know, this is like a part of my history. I was going to say, it's part of your DNA. Exactly, like. yeah. exactly. So that kind of got me started in thinking about quilts. Um, and I had a number of friends that um, started to get into quilting. Even, you know, I was, you know, I'm a young, a relatively young person at the time. Um, and I saw people my age getting into quilting and like being very passionate about it. Um, I saw uh, my mother's friends getting involved in quilting um, and like being very passionate about it. And so then that kind of made me think, what is this, what is this thing about quilting? Mm. And so that's kind of how I got kind of the decorative arts bug. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. So, your great grandmother, when you say she was quilting, was it just for the family, or did she actually, you know, make them and then sell them, or how, how did that work? You know, I'm not sure if she sold them. Now, my family was very much involved in, like, you know, the county fairs, and I actually have um, articles where they like would sell like fruits and vegetables, and like would win awards for like their like amazing squash. Uh, and yeah, yeah. You know, so they were very like entrepreneurial in that way. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if someone, you know, didn't buy her quilts. But from my knowledge of her, um, she sent her, so most of my grandmother's siblings all moved to California, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the 40s. Okay. Um, and so, you know, she sent her quilts to California where her kids were. So when I was growing up, probably one of the reasons why I didn't really know that she was a quilter is that majority of the quilts probably were here uh. <laughs> in California with her kids that she, she basically would make the quilts. My grandmother would help her and then they would, she would send them to California, I see. um, you know, with her kids. I think I may have, um, one of my uh, grandmother's nieces may have, or sisters may have had some quilts after she passed. Um, but but majority of the quilts got sent to California. Oh, no kidding. So it's kind of ironic yeah, for me is, to be here. Yeah, yeah, actually. Uh, yeah, so was that one of the reasons you ended up in California, by the way? You had relatives already here? Yes, yes. I have family in Pasadena. I have family in Los Angeles as well as in North California as well. Oh, okay. So, like, when my grandmother's siblings, they literally left, you know, probably during the second great migration yes. and just kind of scattered across California, uh -huh. you know, one in San Diego, a couple, like, outside of L.A., um, and then the rest, majority, I think, were um, more northern California and San Francisco. But your parents, I believe, are still in um, Yes, my parents Texas. are still in Texas. And majority of my... Um, of my family, like my grandmother had a lot of kids. Yes, yes. <laughs> so like a lot of my cousins, uncles, and aunts are all still in Texas. Uh, okay. But we have a, a really strong California connection. It sounds like it. Yeah. It's funny because my grandmother also was a quilt maker, but most of the quilts just were for the immediate family's use. And, and, mm -hmm. and it was very, uh, so they're from Virginia in the wintertime. It was cold and it had a, an important function of helping to keep everybody warm. Yeah. But it was something beautiful about them as well. When I, I think back on it, my mother ended up with a couple of the quilts. Uh, mm. And my youngest sister actually became a quilt maker, I think, influenced by that. Yeah. I and mean. I think that's what makes it so special to me is that, you know, that, um, you know, it, it has such a utilitarian purpose. Yes. but. It's it's a it's an art form. It's a whole area of creative expression, and you know we're sitting in the G's Bin Gallery. Yes. Um, and it's you know a lot of it is like a, a point of discovery that like you know 
even as I'm making these quilts, like this is like I'm an artist, right? Yes. Um, and so I'm, I love to celebrate that, you know, the artistry within quilts and, you know, the everyday things. Yes. But in addition to that, as I recall, anyway, uh, the quilts that you were mentioning before, like uh, how far back in time it went. And yes, uh, I seem to remember that some of the quilts were even used as part of the Underground Railroad to communicate different things about where to go if you were trying to escape the nightmare of slavery. Yeah, you know, there's so there's a lot of scholars that have that have kind of like said, well, we don't have any proof that that is real or not. Um, and I, you know, I am a scholar myself, so I, I understand the um, the validity of proof, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am an oral historian. Yeah. <laughs> so um, part of um, where that came from was from an oral history, um, you know, interview. So yes. um, I think it's like, you know, it's I think that there's aspects of it that are, I think, are true. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of like, you know, people believing it or not. Uh, yeah. yeah. And once a long time ago in my gallery, there was a quilt project that was kind of sad in a way. And these were um, each family that had their son or daughter or relative of some kind um, killed. Uh, they actually made a patch on this quilt. And so the mm. quilt itself was to tell the story yeah. of, of a, a horrible story as it was of um, and quilts violence. Are have often been used in that way, you know, you know, whether you're making a quilt out of like new fabric or, you know, or using reused fabric, you know, like the old work clothes. Yes. You know, there's a lot of quilts that were made from the scraps of clothes and um, and it tells the story of the time, mm -hmm. you know, and what people were going through, um, the ability to make something out of nothing yes. that, you know, you could use that to keep your family warm. Yes. Um, you know, and, you know, your wedding dress, you know, there's quilts that have, like, pieces of very important clothes, you know, in certain periods of time. So um, they definitely function as, like, a historicizing piece, too, like, for a family, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because as you're saying that, it just – makes me think about how now, and it's a good thing, people are talking about recycling and the importance of repurposing things and not just filling the landfills with everything uh, that you discard. And yet, back in time, I, maybe out of necessity too, when you think about it, they didn't have the luxury of uh, having a lot of uh, resources and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. Reusing things and, and repurposing things. It's kind of a, a nice thing when you think about it. Absolutely. And actually, this quilt by Mary Lee Bendoff is a great example of that. Um, many of the quilters in G's Bend, uh, Mary Lee being one of them, participated in the Freedom Quilting Bee. Um, and as a result of that, they, you know, got different contracts with Sears and Roback and company um, to, you know, create different things like pillowcases or quilts that actually were sold by Sears. And as a result of that, some of that fabric that was left over from those jobs they would then take that fabric and then make quilts from it. And this is actually what this quilt is made out of is from that type of experience. So oh, no kidding. This is all made of corduroy. Um, and so it's it was saved fabric from, you know, that particular um, contract with Sears. Oh, wow, that is incredible. And I want you to talk more about this particular exhibit. But before we go there, I was just curious when you said Sears because Julius Rosenwald was ahead of Sears and he did so much for the black community yeah. with the Rosenwald, um, I don't know, his foundation or grants and so forth. I know Elizabeth Catlett benefited from that, a, a prominent African-American artist, and several others. Um, even my the, the elementary school my mother attended in the, in the uh, early part of the 20th century was built from Rosenwald-donated uh, funds. Wow. I was just curious, was there any kind of, uh, when Sears was doing this with, 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 that, with that contract, was that uh, part of initiative? by Rosenwald or, or do you know? I'm sure I'm sure that could be a possibility for sure. Yeah. I mean I think that there was a there is a sense that this community um, you know was a really strong had a really strong quilting um, 
community. And so also just the ability to um, contract out that work with a community that is so local um, and giving them jobs. Yes. Um, it was really important. Um, you know, and if you know anything about G's Bend, you know that it's very isolated. So like that meant a lot, you know, for the community, for these women or men who may have been in, involved as well. Um to, to get these contracts with Sears wow. um, to provide for their families. So um, I'm sure that that's um, probably a connection for sure. Yeah. So um, why don't we then talk about it? So G's been yeah. maybe start by, uh, well, first of all, we should say that this exhibit here at the Huntington uh, is going to be up until September. September. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and it's been, rotated in and out so there were more pieces than could fit in the in the space at a time that now we're at the last of the rotation right can you yeah so it's been so this is an exhibition a year-long celebration I would say of um, the G's Ben quilts and so we just had a rotation where we we're sharing the second um, second half of the prints that we have in the collection and then our second quilt that's in the quilt collection we have two quilts by Mary Lee Bendoff, this is our second one. Oh. Um, in the first rotation, we featured Mary Lee Bendoff's um, informal um, president's piece, which was an homage to uh, President Barack Obama when he was elected into office. Um, and so this, this particular piece, Diner, is, you know, as I said before, um, like really, you know, uh, a great example of like, the full like tradition of G's been quilting, you know, the reusing of materials, um, you know, in this case, this was from the Sears um, connection. Um, but, you know, like I said before, like, you know, clothes from the family um, or what you can get your hands on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now there's definitely more quilters that, you know, buy new fabric and, you know, are making new quilts. Um, from new materials, but there's a resourcefulness um, in this kind of tradition. And one of the things that um, this exhibition really highlights is that all of the quilters in this show, you know, they learned quilting from their, um, their ancestors, from mothers, grandmothers. So this is literally like a style of quilting that was passed down through generations. And so where is G's Bend? Is it a, is it a place? Yes, it is. So um, G's Bend is a really um, amazing, amazing place. It's, you know, in Alabama, um, just out of, it's like in the Boykin um, part of Alabama, um, just, you know, south of the Alabama, Alabama River. It's actually like a peninsula, so it, it takes a while to get there mm. because it's, it's surrounded by water. Oh, okay. Um, and you could take a ferry to get there, um, but I, I know that there have been times where the ferry hasn't always been open. Mm. So during those times, you, you kind of have to drive and drive and drive to get to it. Takes a while. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to go to G's Bend when I was working on a documentary on African-American quilting um, and the tradition and, and its impact um, socially and culturally. Um, and so it's a really uh, unique place. And I think that that's what makes them unique is the isolation um, that this particular community um, suffered really through, you know, didn't have um, access to a lot of modern amenities for a period of time because of that isolation. Hmm. Um, but through the G's Bend quilters and through their advocacy, advocacy like Mary Lee Bendoff, you know, people know about them and they're purchasing their quilts and that's bringing all sorts of resources and economy to their community. Even to this day? Even to this day. So yes. when did it all start? Do you, do you have a sense of that? Uh, when did they become known? You know, well known, you know, I think so. Obviously, this style of quilting that they've been doing, you know, has been going on for generations. You know, in the 2000s, around um, 2002 is when Will Arnett, uh, who's an art historian, he focuses a lot on like folk art, um, you know, really discovered the G's Band quilters and you know, did a series of exhibitions, one that started in my hometown oh. at the MFA Houston, and then traveled to the Whitney. Um, and that particular exhibition really catapulted the G's Bing quilters to national fame. Mm 
Um, and partly because they were seen as like, you know, that their this style that, you know, came through generations really like looked a lot like the modern um, abstract paintings, you know. Well, even when I look at this piece <laughs> here, by the way, I mean, you know, I, it looks like an abstract uh, exactly. work of art, yeah. And so as they looked at it, they were like, okay, well, this this style of quilting really um, almost predates that, right? So, like, there's actually photographs where you can see this type of quilting happening near G's Bend, like, in the 20s. And, no and kidding. So, so, you know, understanding that this is a community that's been doing this style of quilting for that long, and it's preserved... Um, it's been preserved through all the all these years because, in part, by the isolation. Oh, I see. But then also uh, a, a tenacity and a resistance, right? Because many of these quilters knew how to do, you know, standard quilting block design. So uh -huh. it's not like, you know, some people may think, oh, like, this is all, you know, this is all they know how to do. But this is what they would call my way, I'm going to do it my way, mm -hmm. right? So I know how to do, you know, you know, all the different type of quilt block styles, but this is what I want to do. And that's what makes them artists, right? I love it, right. <laughs> they found their own voice and exactly. they're brave enough to put it out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, that, isn't that the artist's impulse is to say, this is what I want to do and I'm going to do it, right? Yes, of course. So, so that's what makes them so significant and unique, Um and in this particular exhibition, which is what I love, is that um, not only do we have Merely Bendoff's quilts, we also have these awesome prints that, um, you know, three additional quilters, in addition to Mary Lee, participated in, in Berkeley, California, actually, as artists in residence. So this is now the G's Bend quilters as artists, Going to Berkeley, California. I mean, they physically traveled to mm -hmm. Berkeley and created. Now, when you say prints, is it serographs, lithographs? Fine art prints, okay. you know, using the soft ground um, etching process. Ah, okay. That was designed specifically for, for their quilt making. So, you know, Paulson Fontaine Press in Berkeley, um, they worked with the G-Spin quilters for like almost a decade, you know, um, over decades, really, when you think about it. Um, and and some of them were able to go back, you know, over time to make different iterations of these prints. And so um, at the Huntington, we acquired the prints and um, and then later acquired um, Mary Lee Bendoff's quilts. Oh, well. okay. And so when you say you acquired the prints, so you've got, usually when it comes to prints, there's an edition and mm -hmm. there's artist proofs and all the rest of that, right? Yes. So I'm assuming you got... Yeah, one of each yes. from the edition. Is there a limited number of, um, yes. first of all, is there a limited number in each each piece, and is there a limited number total, different I'm types sure. of images? I'm sure, yes. Um, so I know that there's, you know, they're editioned, and um, so you can definitely go and... Um, and still get them, if, <laughs> yeah. you, if you're interested. Yeah. If you're interested. Um, but, you know, they're, they're really special pieces, you know, and there was a like I said, a, a very unique process of printing. You know, fine art prints is, is an art form within itself, right? Exactly. And, and people sh should understand that because a print could be literally a page in a book and uh, there'd be literally thousands of them. But when you yeah. say fine art prints, there, yes, yes. it's a whole different type of uh, image and print and process involved. Exactly. And it was really designed, the process was designed to be able to really fully capture their styles, right? And uh, okay. that they were able to, the soft ground etching process uh -huh. um, was used so that that way it would capture like the, the texture of fabric you know, the, the stitchings, you know, the, the denim that, you know, that some of the quilters may have been using in their quilt tops that they made. So it, so it really captures some of that. Is there a way to explain uh, maybe in layman's terms what you mean by soft ground <laughs> etching? Because I'm guessing that the etching involves a plate of some kind. Yes, and yes. And then the, the paper is applied to the, uh, um, to the plate and there's under a lot of pressure and then the ink gets transferred to the image. But beyond that, can you? Yeah. Can you so, so the soft ground um, etching process is where there's like a wax. It's like a wax surface mm -hmm. on the plate, 
And then you're able to put the these quilt tops, which they made um, custom at Paulson Plantain oh. Press. So they, you know, would take their quilts with them and then translate them to these quilt tops of various different sizes. Okay. Um, and then those quilt tops are what got put on the wax. So then that wax then capture is what's capturing ah. um, the the textures um, that are on it, and I see. that's you. Know, you, you go through the whole printing process from there. So that kind of helps to understand the soft grain, the soft ground aspect. That makes sense. So it can pick up the texture and then then sort of uh, transmit it, basically. Exactly, yeah. So it's it's a really groundbreaking, really, like they designed this process. I was going to say, they specifically designed this process Mm -hmm. just for this purpose. Yeah, because they wanted to be able, you know, like you can make prints in a lot of different ways, right? But they wanted, for fine art prints, you want them to to really carry the essence of like the artist's style, exactly. right? You want to still have the the values of what that artist they're you know what they're making as a part of the work. So they they really did a good job. Oh, that's <laughs> fantastic! Yeah, that. that's fantastic. I know. And looking around in this room, I mean, looking at these uh, different prints, they look very very convincing. Yes. In terms of the texture and so forth. Yeah. And so in this room, there's. Everything in here is a print except for this, uh, except for this, uh, this particular piece here. Yeah, and the the beauty of it is, you know, you're seeing, you know, with Mary Lee Bendoff's quilt, you know, this is like a sign the signature G's Bend style. So you're seeing these textures in real life, mm-hmm. and then you're seeing you can look throughout the gallery and see how dur- with this printing process how those essences were then captured, you know, through the print. So you're able to kind of make that comparison. And all of the prints are not merely Bendoff. We have um, Loretta Bennett, Loretta Petway. We have Louisiana Bendoff. Oh. Um, we also um, have. Uh, yeah, I'm forgetting someone. There's there's a total for four four, four different artists. And all are these uh, are all of these artists still alive? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay. So um, you know, living artists and. Um, and we're capturing the essence of like their styles. Um, when I went to G Spin, you know, um, and probably back in 2002 when they were first discovered, many of um, the quilters didn't necessarily see themselves as artists, right? So mm-hmm. for them to be, you know, doing this artist residency is to acknowledge and to affirm that, you know, no, you're an artist and you're you're you know you're doing things that any other artist would do. So that's that's really why I really love this this exhibition. It's really celebrating them as as artists. Well, I think it's really cool. Uh, and I tell you, it's hard to see if you're looking uh, through the camera, but the texture of that piece there, like you said, it's corduroy. So yeah. just imagine corduroy, and it's got that texture. And It makes you want to touch it, it but does. you can't. <laughs> I, keep, I keep, keep resisting. You know, I'm like tempted. Mm-hmm. Well, that's <laughs> but don't worry, I won't touch it. The thing about quilts, you know, is that we all, you know, we all like, you know, we have, we wear clothes. We're all like very, um, have a visceral reaction to fabric. Sure. Because we. You don't want to touch it, right? We, we touch fabric all the time. It's, it's on, we're wearing it. Yeah, we're wearing it. So um, when we see, you know, quilts in an exhibition, it's, it's not abnormal for people to want to like get up close <laughs> and touch it and look yes. behind it. Um, because it, if it's very relatable, it's yeah. very it's in, it's interconnective, you know, to people's lives, um, and you know, you know, everyone doesn't wear corduroy all the time. Uh, it, actually, looking at this quilt made me think, wow, like I need to get some more corduroy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny. I remember as a kid wearing corduroy pants, mm-hmm. walking around, and sometimes uh, my mom got me these corduroys, and the the, I don't know what you described, the various ribs of the quarry or whatever, yes. were so so thick. Every yes. time I walked, it kind of made a small sound, <laughs> and I would see a tease, you know, I was like, wow. But these are a more fine uh, yes. corduroy, yeah. I guess you could say. And it was more, more. Uh, we always wore corduroys when it was colder outside. Right. The summer months, it wouldn't be something yes. you would put on. Right. Is that, is that the same? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, when you think about that, um, you know, when – these quilters are making these as like tangible quilt objects. Mm -hmm. You know, most of most quilters, when they're making a quilt, they're making it for utilitarian purposes. So if you have corduroy on the quilt, then that's going to be a nice, warm, cozy quilt. Oh yes, absolutely. (laughs) 
So it's doing its job. I, I, I could have used that this morning. And I woke yeah. up, it was kind of chilly outside today. When I was interviewing different quilters and they would talk about like their experiences of like learning quilting from like their grandmothers, you know, they talk about the use of corduroy and denim and how it makes like the most cozy quilts because they're, it's this heavy fabric material. Sure. And so when you lay underneath a, a denim, you know, quilt or a corduroy quilt, well, then it's it's just like you feel like you're being hugged. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, it def- I get that hug feeling when I look at Mary Lee's quilt. Yeah, now that you mention it, so do I. It brings back <laughs> memories, too. <laughs> yes, yes. You mentioned Louisiana. What, what does that mean? Does that mean she made it while she was in Louisiana? Uh, so that's her name. Her name, oh, her is, name is uh, Louisiana. Yes, so, and, and I think it's great to talk about, like, we're thinking about these particular quilters in the gallery. These are different generations of G's Bang quilters. So like Mary Lee and Loretta um, Pedway, you know, they're like really the senior senior quilters. Okay. Um, Louisiana and Loretta Bennett, you know, they're really the the younger generation of G's Bang quilters. They've had the um, experience of living both inside and outside of G's Bend. Oh. So um, you can tell, like, when you look at their quilts, that um, they're really innovative, you know, um, the, the ways in which that they're kind of stretching the limits of more housetop style quilts. Well, um, when you say housetop, what, what do you mean? That's a good question. So housetop quilts are, like, where you have, like, a like a square in the middle. It's what they we call it a medallion. Oh, I and see. And then you have all these bars around it. And so, like, with Mary Lee's quilt, you have, like, all of these different medallions. Yes. You know, and then there's these bars around it. Okay. It's almost like an aerial view of, like, different houses oh, in, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, But like with Louisiana, you know, you can see that she has a medallion in the middle, but it's like, it's like an abstracted medallion, right? Uh, It's not completely a square. It's like, you know, almost abstracted squares all in one. And then you have the bars around it. So, uh, you know, they're, they're testing, testing and experimenting on, you know, different styles and almost like becoming even more modern, even more abstract. So it's really exciting to see. That's interesting. It relates back to the other thing earlier you said that they're just finding their own voice and exactly. they're brave enough to, um, to explore that. To explore that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you mentioned before that you had done a documentary. I wanted to explore that too, by the yes, way. Yes. So yes. tell us about that. What, what First of all, what uh, prompted you to do that? And uh, tell us about uh, what it was about and, and how it came about. If you don't yeah. Mind. So, you know, my personal work um especially during graduate school, was looking at um, the color complex or uh, colorism within um, African-American culture, even though we know that it's not only specific to um, black culture. There's many cultures that have skin color hierarchies. Um, And so my work often dealt with that history and and trying to understand and grapple with that history. Um, So while I was doing this body of work, I'm learning about, you know, all these quilters in my life. Um, And many of them would talk about how um, by starting to quilt, that they were starting to have a more positive sense of self and personal um, uh, body image or self-image of themselves. And so then that made me think about, well, that's interesting. You know, so on one hand, I'm thinking about hierarchies and how, You know, oftentimes it makes people feel really bad about their skin color. And then yet, you know, within a a quilting community, uh, community, you know, they're feeling like a complete opposite reaction. You know, like not that those complexes don't exist, Mm -hmm. but that, you know, in this safe environment where I'm, you know, I'm accomplishing the goal of making a quilt, I'm feeling better about myself. You know, I'm feeling good about you know, let's say like, you know, outside of this world, I'm being told that I'm not, you know, I'm not beautiful. I'm not this, I'm not that. Yeah. In this world, like I'm, I'm amazing. I'm, I'm creative. Wow. I'm smart. Um, I can make a quilt. Can you make one? Yeah, right. <laughs> it takes a long time to make a quilt. I was going to say, just <laughs> looking at it, it's kind of intimidating. 
So, um, so I'm hearing these stories from different women that are like, oh my God, quilting changed my life. I feel so much better about myself. And so I was like, oh my God, I want to explore this, you know? And, um, I discovered also, so there's different styles of quilts, obviously, um, quilts that are like definitely, you know, more for utilitarian purposes or, you know, more improvisational like the G spin quilts but then there's also the story quilt style which is also very prominent within the african-american community um those quilters would talk about how you know they would intentionally make sure that the skin complexions were black you know even though they know that there's a spectrum of black people yes but their statement was to say that black is beautiful right mm-hmm. so it was like a it was a resistance against you know within culture that would say light is better um and black is bad it's to say no like black is beautiful um or or they would intentionally make a spectrum of skin colors to say hey all of us are beautiful right, right. So um, that documentary really explored the fact that quilters really were like engaging in this conversation about skin color, about self-worth and value. Fantastic. And is that something somebody could uh, tune into some kind of way or is that available somewhere? Yeah, so we're making it available again. Uh Um, It used to be on Hulu and on uh, IndieFlix, which is like the... Um, Netflix for independent film, um, but we're in the process of of putting it back out there for folks to see it. It was out there for like 10, 10 years or so, um, so now we're we're releasing it again. That's fantastic. I encourage people to check it out. I know I am. I'm, I'm very curious to see. Yeah. And that's an interesting aspect to quilting yeah, yeah. as a, a confidence builder. You know, at the, when you were describing it, it made me think of James Brown's song, you know, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud that's kind right. of a thing. That's they were right. kind, of, kind of saying that, basically. Yeah. And I mean, you, you see it when you're um, like when you look at G's Ben um, quilters and they're, you know, they're together and they're singing about, you know, being proud and just, you know, they may be singing a gospel song, but you know that there's something about quilting that is producing that positive response. I love that. It's like yeah. self-affirmation. It's Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you're in a community with other people that look like you Mm -hmm. and they're affirming you they're saying oh that's good you're doing a good job keep going you know you know keep making more quilts so it's you know it's a very encouraging community of people to be and and before I when I was making the skin coat project I had never made a quilt (laughs) (laughs) um and by the time I finished making the film there I mean because I was encouraged so much to like make one I might I made a quilt you made a quilt (laughs) do you still have it I do still have it, oh, okay. yeah, and and I started to work w- more with with fabric um, in my in my work oh, after that. That's so awesome. it it gave, it built my own confidence. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, about when was that you made the, uh, the documentary? Um, so that was I did the production in two thousand nine, right. and then um, we you know did a lot of uh, um, exhibiting it around, and um, it was in the. Uh, International Black Women's Film Festival in Berkeley oh, okay. um, in, in 2010. And so it kind of took the rounds in, in that year. Fantastic. Congratulations, by the way. That's, Thank that's awesome. you. Have you made any other documentaries or do you plan to? You know, you never know. You never say never. Of course. Never <laughs> <say> never. <laughs> you never know. Um, I think primarily after, right after that, that's when I started my doctoral program. Um, and so a lot of my films after that were more academic oriented, like, or like for my students to help them to understand concepts and things like that. But I'm not counting it out. It, <laughs> of course. Just watch this space. You never know. I might pop out with a, another <laughs> film. But I, 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 in my art practice, I often do incorporate video um, and create films, you know, film installations and stuff like that. Oh, so, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and what was your PhD in, by the way? What did you get your doctorate in? Yeah, so my PhD is in Multicultural Women's and Gender Studies. I went to Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what is that all about? I don't think I'm Yeah, familiar. so, you know, after doing the Skin Cool Project and, you know, really discovering that I was interested in the creative lives of, of women or just gender more broadly because I've also looked at 
um, masculinity and, you know, how that impacts, um, you know, what we make or what, you know, how we create our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I was like, I really want to kind of do more in that. I want to kind of explore, um, the, the intersections of race and gender. And so that's kind of what led me to the PhD. Um, and so my research, um, in that, was all about women artists of color and how exhibitions and curating um, creates a platform to, so that we can have more exhibitions like G's Bin and museums and galleries. You know, it, it's a way of creating voice um, and, and bringing more aw- awareness um, to what other women artists are doing. So that's kind of like you know, graduate school kind of got me sparked on like, hey, the, you know, the plight of women artists, you know, um, and how to create more opportunity. And that's the thing. I mean, I, I, in my own history of starting my gallery, for instance, one of the things I was reacting against was this deliberate um, avoidance, let's just say, or uh, ignoring of the contributions of African American artists, but Absolutely. as I delved a little deeper into it myself, I discovered it was also like a subcategory: female artists, mm-hmm. even within the African American community, were sort yeah. of being pushed aside and not really uh, getting proper due. Yeah, yeah, and that and that really came a lot came out a lot in my research, um, and really um, was the reason why I started my own gallery um, um, when I was in Fort Worth, um, which was completely dedicated to women artists of color. Uh-huh. Um, even though I might add, I it wasn't just only women artists, I also included um, the works of male artists as well. Oh, okay. Um, but my thought was, you know, to be in conversation, you know, um, and to find ways to allow artists to speak to one another, even if their background might look different from one another. And, you know, just creating that space. Sure. You know, as artists, you know, we're not monolithic, you know, we're, we're all complex and um, we may be all within one racial group, but, you know, there's different people in the world that can relate to us, you know, so I wanted to test, you know, test that and, and you know, show artists from different backgrounds in the same exhibition together um, so that that way they could be in conversation around themes um, and then also, I did a lot of solo exhibitions and stuff of their work too. So. That's awesome. So yeah. I'm curious. So do you um, obviously now you're in California, you're not in yeah. Texas anymore. But how long did you have your your gallery, and is that something you're still pursuing? Or so um, I had the gallery for almost three years, um, and then after after I closed the physical space, I operated more in a hybrid mode, which uh-huh. was you know, curating exhibitions in partnership with other institutions. So whether it was another museum that was working on an exhibition, um, you know, I would, you know, through through that same vehicle of my organization, you know, it was more like an, um, became more almost like an initiative because my thought process was that I wanted this kind of diversity to exist everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Not just in my gallery, um, but everywhere. Yeah. So um, when I closed the space and it was like, okay, well, who else can I work with that I can, you know, bring the essence of that same idea to them? And so um, that's a lot of what my consulting is really in bringing um, diversity in the arts um, in ways in which, you know, sometimes people just don't feel comfortable doing it themselves. And so um, so I've done a lot of curatorial work like that. So I do. I still do, um, you know, consult and things like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And as we're recording this, this is March of 2023, and we are here at the Huntington uh, Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. And you've only actually been a, a curator here since uh, two months ago, right? Yeah, it's like um, now, I guess, getting into the third month. <laughs> <laughs> third month, now we're going, moving into the third. And so what brought you here? You know, I was really excited about what the Huntington was doing, Um, you know, really encouraged by their strategic plan um, and the desire to bring um, more artists of color in the collection. Um, And when this particular position came open, you know, I already had a decorative arts background. Yes. 
um, and a history of working with contemporary artists that work in the realm of decorative arts. Yes. So, um, so I was like, ah, oh, like I feel like this is this feels like me, you know. Yes. Um, and I just really was excited about everything that they were doing, and um, it all worked out. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> well, congratulations, and, by the way, on the position. And yeah. I just want to say how much I appreciate the Huntington for bringing you here because. Just in talking with you and in the time that we've spoken before this uh, on-air interview, I am totally impressed with uh, you as a person, but also as a, uh, an authority on, on decorative arts. This has been Thank fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been such a pleasure to meet you and get to know you, and I look forward to going and visiting you and at your gallery yeah, as well. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having you. And I, I'm also very appreciative to the Huntington for the, uh, I know that, you, this happened before you got here, but the Kahindi Wildy uh, Commission. Uh, yes. I thought that was really a cool thing. They had him speak here. I was at the reception. And yes. That was kind of fantastic. You were just saying how they're committed to diversity. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, it's obvious from what they're doing. It's, I applaud what they're doing. Let me just Absolutely. say that. Absolutely. I mean, all of that, you know, from Kahinde to G's Ben, which, ben. you know, when I was um, coming um, to interview, G's Ben was here. So, of course, I felt like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm coming home. <laughs> um, because, you know, th these are all of the things that, um, you know, when I imagine a museum in the future um, would be doing these types of things. Yes. And they're doing it now. Yes. You know, so I feel like um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited for what's to come. There's more awesome things to come. Well, now that you said that, <laughs> I don't know how much you can say, but uh, what is in store? I mean, what what can you talk about that's um, in the offing or in the maybe uh, not so near future? Well, I will say I can't say everything that's to come. Of course, um, you're just gonna have to sit in suspense and wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but you know what's up right now that I'm really excited about, um, in addition to the G Spin, is the Antideca Akuna Crosby show, which which is currently ex exhibiting. Is right? currently exhibiting, and it'll be up until I think June. Okay. Um, and it was a part of the Hilton All series that the Huntington did um, in partnership with the Yale Center for British art oh. um and it's an amazing amazing exhibition it's uh, adjacent to the kahinde wiley um a gallery adjacent to it so anyone who is um contemplating a visit to the huntington should absolutely come and see it as well, well come, come see g's ben and then go see kahinde wiley and into deca there so, you go i mean that's it go. Folks, I'm <laughs> telling you, if you're listening and, and watching, please get over here. It's it's beautiful here just in general. The grounds themselves are yes. uh, just breathtakingly beautiful. The, the gardens, the vegetation, but the art uh, yes. is awesome. Awesome. And and also in the American galleries, we have a fabulous exhibition, an uh, ongoing exhibition called Borderlands, which is looking at indigenous knowledges and contributions in American art as well. Oh, fantastic. Um, and, and, and I would say indigenous uh, conversations, you know, both with traditional like landscapes, but also interventions as well with um, with art, contemporary artists. So it's exciting. Oh, that sounds exciting. And I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, is there an educational component? Uh, are there um, uh, yes. educational opportunities here as well? Obviously, than just visiting and seeing Sure. The well, you know, one can always reach out um, to schedule a tour, to visit the galleries. Um, and then there's also, um, we have wonderful docents here at the Huntington that, that give tours. And we have educators that, ed that do tours as well. Okay. Um, so there's lots of different opportunities um, that are available at the Huntington. Oh, fantastic. And now more on a personal level, on your on your own art, are, are you working on anything now that we should be aware of in terms of your own yes, art? Yes, yes. So I have a, um, a solo exhibition that's coming up in the fall, late, well, early fall, really. Um, and it's kind of a, um, a conglomerate of um, all the works that I've done over the past 10 years. But with some additional works. So um, a lot of my work has looked at um, cultural traditions within my family or like heirlooms that I've inherited over the years. And then I, you know, use those to kind of tell stories about African-American history and culture. Uh -huh. um, so one of uh, a, a pamphlet that uh, my mother inherited 
um, was a pamphlet by Nanny um, Helen Barrows, um, activist, uh, very uh, involved in the women's movement and the um, the Baptist conventions. You know, when she was very what time period would that? Have been? Oh my goodness! Roughly, roughly. <laughs> I would say definitely in the within the nineteenth century for sure. Oh, okay, um, you know, post slavery, but you know, really in in and probably post Reconstruction. But like she was really um, active in the suffrage movement, so that gives you some context sure. state wise. Yeah. Um, and she was really um, thinking a lot about like women's black women's voices oh. um, during those times, and she really believed in educating black women and black girls. What was her name again? Nanny Helen Burroughs. Okay. Um, so my grandmother actually had a pamphlet of hers. Um, and one thing about my grandmother, she often signed everything, you know, whether it was her Bible or a pamphlet. Um, and so obviously it had it meant something to her mm-hmm. um, and was someone that she studied. She was a very avid reader. So um, this was somebody that she you know, I'm sure probably admired because she was a missionary herself in the church. Um, And then Helen Burroughs was like very active within like missionary groups and things like that. I see. Um, So I have a body of work that is um, looking at that pamphlet. um, That is so awesome. And and kind of teasing out who Nanny Helen Burroughs was um, and why she was important to people like my grandmother. So that's a it's a, a series that I've been working on for a while. That sounds extremely interesting. And where will that be seen? Where where can somebody see that? Um, it's going to be at the University of Wyoming, actually. So ah. um, so I'm excited to um, create more uh, pieces within. It's a it's going to be a a, a bigger work. Oh, okay. um, that um, initially I did about ten ten pieces in that series, and so I'm continuing to unpack and do more. Oh. In that series. Well, I've got to see it one way or the other. I don't know about yeah. it. Maybe, maybe I can. I've never been to Wyoming before. This might be the impetus for me. To go. I've it, never w- been either. <laughs> will, will, it, will it travel or only be there? Well, it could travel okay. for sure. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just exciting because um, just from an artist standpoint, I'm sure you know, um, you know, putting your work in conversation with um, with other works that you've done often allows it to speak to one another you know sometimes you have works that like or you know it's in this show and this sh- this work is in that show and Scattered they've never around. shown together before yes so um so i'm excited about the opportunity to like bring all of these works that i've been working on for some time together um in one space well, i'm excited um, for you and i'm excited for what's to come from that um, so. yeah will there be a, a catalog or I'm hoping so. Yeah, maybe I, I might. I might get you to help me with it because you do good catalog. Thank you, and I would be more than happy to help you too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Well, listen, Lauren, I really am grateful to you for taking the time uh, to speak with me and to make yourself available for this uh, talk uh, on our podcast and for sharing your perspective. I think uh, the Huntington is very fortunate to have you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time as well and for wanting to come to visit with me at the Huntington. Ah, and this will not be my, I'm coming back for sure. And I'm I'm (laughs) looking forward to you coming into the gallery too. Yes. Uh, Yeah. Thank you. And uh, for all of you out there, thanks to God for tuning in and please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Uh